not the entire discipline, because what we're going to do next uh, in this series is go through every one of the countries of Latin America, one by one, and beginning with the discussion of primitive communism in each. Now, we just got done going through foundations of archaeology because it's archaeology which is primarily the focus of reconstructing primitive communism. But it's one thing to get the data out of the ground, it's another thing to interpret it. And to interpret it, we need the principles of anthropology, which is why I want to go through in this particular lecture some of those things which will be useful for you to remember and to understand. There are four sub-disciplines to anthropology, which originally was defined as the science of man. Man has now been changed largely in presentations to the science of people. But at any rate, beginning in the late 1800s going forward, we have had uh, four divisions, and that is cultural anthropology, physical anthropology, anthropological linguistics, and archaeology. Now, I have just got done going through principle or foundations of archaeology with you, so we won't need to do that again because we've already done it. What we want to do then is start with cultural anthropology because that was the original uh, main focus for people that considered themselves to be anthropologists. Anthropology in this sense is different than sociology, which in North America and Europe uh, developed in a different direction. Sociology, primarily in our country and in Europe, has been focused on the application of statistical methods to problems of social work that people may encounter and soci social questions of the moment that um, can be separated from the more general, broader discipline of anthropology, which takes a look at the question of the origins of people to begin with, that is the origins of Homo and especially Homo sapiens, the, their physical origins, which is an area we call physical anthropology. Cultural anthropology is what we're going to focus on right now, and I'll just mention that there is the area of anthropological linguistics will come to last, which is a little bit different than traditional linguistics. Um, at any rate, let's start with cultural anthropology. Now, in the 1800s, after the U.S. Civil War, there was a, a blossoming of interest by intellectuals in Europe and North America in fundamental questions about what are people, why is it that some people are more advanced than others, um, how do primitive people organize their societies as opposed to the way modern people organize their society. These were fundamental questions that were addressed by a number of people, but the most important one of which turned out to be the American millionaire lawyer Lewis Henry Morgan. So I'm going to start with him. He's also important because his work was quickly incorporated by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels into their worldview, and as a consequence, Morgan's acceptance in North America changed. We'll see how that happened. Um, Morgan, as a young man, came from a wealthy family. He went to law school and university in the state of New York. When he was there, he got really interested in the Iroquois Indians, and um, one of his first books was called League of the Iroquois. This was taken from a kind of fraternity he created when he was in university that he called League of the Iroquois. Um, and he began to develop a view that these people that were generally considered primitive by Protestant white North Americans were in fact not primitive at all and had a very admirable social system. So Morgan when he began to practice law began to make even more money on his own initiative so he had a, a powerful standing within the political elite of his time. And he was so powerful that he was able to extend his study of the Iroquois to every primitive society in the world. Well, how did he do that? Well, the mechanics of it were that he was able to get the U.S. State Department to circulate to all of the embassies that they ran around the world a questionnaire which he asked that they would go out and and have that questionnaire answered by the people that he named, the tribes, and uh, uh, it, wherever they were. If they happened to be in some African country, then he would have them do that. 
or Asian country and so on. In other words, he had the complete disposal of the U.S. Foreign Service who was um, happy to help him because he was, after all, an, an important millionaire and a scientist and uh, these are the kind of people that are running Washington. So uh, that's what he did. Now from that particular study, he collated all his information, studied it for years as he came in, wrote a book called Systems of Consanguinity and Affinity, um, which even to this day is recognized as perhaps the first great contribution to American anthropology uh, as a science. Now, Morgan had all of the prejudices of a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant background of his time, not the least of which is he hated Catholics. Perhaps not Catholics as individuals, but he hated the Catholic Church, and he would not believe anything that Catholic priests had written about Mexico, for example. He said it's all a pack of lies. He took the position that uh, the Mexicans of the Aztecs type, that the Catholic priests had described as kings and emperors and so on, he said that was all just a complete lie, that the Aztecs, for example, had never gotten above the, a certain level of chiefdoms. And that, uh, well, anyway, my point here is that these were prejudices that were held in common by many people, um, and they continued to be well into my lifetime. You may remember that uh, Franklin Roosevelt, in his speech to the country and to the troops that was broadcast at the moment of the U.S. D-Day invasion in June 6, 1944, he said, we're going to war for a variety of reasons, and he gave them, he said, for our country, um, for our religion. Now, he did, when he said our religion, he meant it Protestantism. All of the biographers for FDR have cited many times his oft-quoted remarks that the Jews and the Catholics are here on probation. Now, when you stop and think that FDR was one of the most liberal and progressive people in North America, the fact that he could look at Jews and Catholics in that way shows you an awful lot about the mindset that was there. Well, Morgan shared this mindset back in the late 1800s, and um, he came, therefore, to the completely wrong conclusions about Aztec society. But other than that, which was, in fact, a high, uh, a uh, early kingdom and then an early empire uh, and class divided into ruling class and slaves, but uh, other than that, Morgan was generally recognized uh, and continues to be now as the father of American anthropology and a true scientist. Well, what did he do exactly with all of that data that the State Department gathered for him through the these questionnaires and well he, he wrote another book which came to the attention of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels and that was called Ancient Society. Now in the last paragraph of that book Morgan says that in his view what's going to happen is that the ancient order of the gens by which he means the primitive egalitarian clan society that uh, he's been describing throughout the book, Ancient Society, is going to be recreated on a new technological foundation. In other words, the primitive communism of the tribes and bands that he had been studying anthropologically was going to come back, but this time it was going to come back on a high capitalist technological basis. And that's how he concludes Ancient Society. Well, when Marx and Engels read this um, in, in Europe in 1877, they said, well, he's right, he's got it all, and he, you know, blah, blah. They, they, and they quickly made that opinion of theirs clear. And over the next seven years, um, Marx went into Morgan's book in great depth. And uh, in the years after that, so did Frederick Engels. And, of course, in the 20th century, we had an explosion in uh, the number of anthropologists in all four of these sub-areas. So we've acquired a great deal of information. Well, by incorporating Lewis Henry Morgan into the pantheon of Marxist textbooks, um, what he had done in one way was to uh, a disservice to Morgan as an individual because as far as the capitalist class in the United States was concerned, Morgan was now a traitor. Um, he had, of course he wasn't really. He, 
He was just doing some good scientific work. Morgan never changed from being what he had been all his life, which was a conservative, Republican, lawyer, millionaire, uh, with all of the prejudices of his time, which were in, and I'm 72 years old, almost 73. I can tell you that when I was growing up in the night, late 40s and 50s, that this was still a common view of, of towards uh, Catholics, and for example, in uh, where I grew up, and I can remember that my grandmother making me promise that whatever I did, I would never become a Catholic because to her, the Pope was the devil, the Antichrist, and. Uh, that wasn't an unusual view among uh, white people in this country at that time. At any rate, Morgan fell out of favor pretty quickly after Marx gave him the prime position in Marxist anthropology so that very quickly he was no longer of anybody that the State Department wanted to have anything to do with. Now, how did that change? Well, it didn't change right away. Uh, they did their very best in this country, the capitalist press and its institutions, to denigrate in any way possible uh, the contribution of Lewis Henry Morgan, but they had kind of a hard time coming up with somebody to take his place until after World War I and the Bolshevik Revolution when they really got scared. Now, during World War I, there was a man named Franz Boas, B-O-A-Z, uh, or S, <laughs> the, um, who had um, gotten in a lot of trouble because he had been attacked as being pro-German. So that was the primary issue he had affected at that time. But after the war, after World War I, uh, Boas began to become more popular with the U.S. ruling circles because he uh, had an interesting position, which was that um, very similar to what anthropologists believe today in many ways, but the essence of it that was of interest to capitalist ideologists was that he was contradicting Karl Marx and Frederick Engels on the most basic assumptions, which was that human society could be described in terms of laws that they called the laws of history. Boas says, no, human society is way too complex and we have way too little information at this point in time, 1924, uh, to draw up any kind of laws. And he spawned a school of his own, largely out of New York and out of Columbia, and uh, re people like Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict be joined that school, and uh, they suddenly had access to the capitalist press. So those names are probably familiar to some of you and Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict, I mean, and uh, all of a sudden that's the kind of thing that began to dominate those universities, which are still mostly in private hands in North America in 1920. There, aren't, there isn't much in the way of state universities that have anthropology programs. There are state universities, land-grant universities, that are concentrating on things like agriculture, but the, uh, for the intellectual elite, there are only a few. Uh, universities, and they're easily dominated by this Boaz type, and since their boards of governors are picked, hand-picked capitalist agents, members of the upper elite of the capitalist class, they uh, can pretty much dominate what's, uh, direct what's going to happen. Well, one young man who saw all of this and who objected to it was named Leslie White. In the 1930s, he uh, left Columbia as a student and he went to the Soviet Union and he traveled across the Soviet Union, came out the other side, came back to the United States and went back into the university, finished his PhD under Boaz, and, uh, which wasn't easy because he didn't like Boaz and Boaz didn't like him, but at any rate he, uh, he, he got his PhD there and after the war, World War II this time, he decided to rehabilitate Lewis Henry Morgan if he could. Now, he also wanted to bring Marxism back into anthropology at its primary point in theoretical terms. So he did several different things. One of the things he did was to change Marx's terminology into something new. He knew that if he used the phrases forces of production, 
relations of production and superstructure that even the dullest capitalist agent would figure out that this came from capital, Karl Marx's book, or from Frederick Engels' book, The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. So he changed that. Forces of production he called technology. Relations of production he called social organization. Superstructure he called ideology. That quickly was accepted in, uh, across the country. Now something else important that was happening in, at that time is that the U.S. Congress had followed Roosevelt's uh, uh, dictate and passed the GI Bill. So what that meant was that we had millions of boys and girls, too, coming back from World War II who uh, wanted to go to university and who could do it for the first time because Congress had made money available under the GI Bill for people to go to college and get a degree. And what that did was to pump a huge amount of money into higher education, the construction of new universities, which are no longer under the control of private families, uh, or at least not as much as they had been up until then. So when White got out of college and he uh, published them, started publishing his papers, one of the first things he did was to rehabilitate Morgan and create what he called the Neo-Evolutionary School giving Morgan the credit for having discovered social and cultural evolution and being the original evolutionist. Now, he's saying we are new evolutionists. And he began to populate these GI Bill universities with students that followed his line in, the, in this kind of thinking. So by 1950, we had a completely different academic situation. Anthropology was now dominated by neo-evolutionists under the leadership of Leslie White who wrote a book called The Evolution of Culture. And that we're going to come back to in a moment. So this is the political background for how Marxism came back uh, into North American anthropology. Well, of the various four sub-disciplines we just mentioned that were least affected by reaction uh, from the U.S. ruling class was archaeology because Archaeologists, by the very nature of their work, had a hard science orientation. Uh, they were digging things up in the ground and mapping their position and doing the kind of things we talked about in the last lecture here. And that kind of insulated them to a certain degree from reaction. On the other hand, uh, the other subdisciplines weren't quite as lucky. Now, in cultural Let's go back and take a look at what Morgan had accomplished and then what other everybody else followed up on as years went by. In ancient society, Morgan had, took all of the tribes and all of the information that he had gathered uh, for the publication of the book on constant systems of consanguinity and affinity and divided the entire world of these primitive societies into two parts and, uh, or, well, he called them societus and civitus, meaning the different primitive kinship organized society versus modern state organized society. And for the modern states, he had kind of culture such as that of Rome and Greece and so on. Well, this was as far as he took that. But another man named Murdoch had uh, taken the societus part of this uh, and divided these kinship organized societies into eight different groups. Well, how did that, how do you come to these conclusions? Well, what Morgan had done with his original questionnaire circulated by the State Department was to have them ask a person in a tribe, say in Africa or wherever, um, how do you call your mother? What is the name that you use for your father? What is the name, what is the name you use for your mother's brother? what we would call an uncle. What's your, what is the name that you use for your mother's sister? What is the name you use for your father's brother? What is the name you use for your father's sister? Then the same thing with what we would call the siblings of uh, marriage and the cousins. Specific questions, you get specific terms. Well, why was this important? It was important, Morgan showed, because ancient society was organized completely on the basis of kinship and without the use of the state whatsoever, the state being armed force in the hands of a ruling class. First of all, you didn't have class division, and secondly, you didn't have 
force in the hands of the ruling class, therefore, and so, but society still had to be organized. And he was able to prove that uh, primitive society organized itself on the basis of kinship. Now, in his time, in his book, Ancient Society, he just made this rough break between societies organized on the basis of kinship and those modern times that are not, that are organized politically on the basis of class and state. But Murdoch, in his book, Social Structure, took these, this uh, kinship organized society to a new level. And he would show, and he had eight different societies. For example, one, Eskimo society, and uh, another Hawaiian society, um, another Iroquois, and, and so on, where he said many societies belong to this group, many societies belong to that group. Well, in the case of the Hawaiians, for example, he said, Everybody of a father, the father and all of the male members of the society of the same age are called father by anybody in the society. Um, the same thing, it's not just the biological mother, but all women of that age are called mother by youngsters. And uh, then he showed that they also grouped the ter uh, terms, grouped all of the people that we would call cousins into another group. And... Uh, with Eskimo society, he used that as an example of uh, something similar to what we have today, but showed that it was actually quite different. And anyway, he, he broke these things down, and we still use Murdoch's uh, classification today because it was so highly accurate. And he, Murdoch eventually published what he called the World Ethnographic Atlas, which is now online, computerized, and you can go in there and ask a question such as, how many societies calculate their descent in terms of matrilineal or patrilineal terms? Which brings us to this point, the next point in the principles of anthropology is that primitive societies practice lineality, calculating how you're related to one another through a lineage, and they calculate it on the basis of post-marital locality. Where do you, when you get married, where do you go to live? Uh, do you go to live with your wife's parents? Do you go to live with your husband's family? Um, do you go to live with the uncle of your mother's, <laughs> what we would call the uncle, your mother's brother's family? Um, those are systems of locality. This is completely unfamiliar to us because, well, when you get married over here, uh, you uh, go out and establish a new household someplace based on, but not based upon where your parents live. Um, so, you have to begin to real. If you really want to get into this, you can study these books I'm just mentioning to you, and um, you'll get a deep understanding of it. But for purposes of our discussion, when we're talking about primitive communism in Brazil or Argentina or Peru, Venezuela, or Mexico, uh, remember the principles of lineage, uh, lineage and uh, locality are operating at postmarital re residence principles. We also have the principles of exogamy and endogamy, which are related to the incest taboo. Now, the incest taboo is variable. Um, in some societies, it's very strict. You can't marry your sister, your mother, your father, or your first cousin. In other societies, it's very loose. Um, now, whether those rules are imposed on a given person uh, outside of his family unit or inside of his family unit are called rules of exogamy and endogamy and they are regulations of this incest taboo. So these are important things to, to realize that pin, kinship society is not simple. It's uh, any given person on a kinship chart starts with a point it's called an ego and from there we start to try to determine on the basis of the terminology that he would use to refer to his mother's brother's son and so on uh, and to establish a system of obligations, rights, and responsibilities because in that society your obligations, rights, and responsibilities are not defined by laws or codes. Such things don't exist. They're defined from your childhood forward by the way you're taught you should relate to a certain person. You have certain obligations to that person, and that person has a certain obligation to you if he happens to be your mother's cousin. Um, 
And that's the way whole society on this earth was organized for millions of years. We assume back in Homo australopithecine times as well as in Homo, and Homo erectus times as well as in modern Homo sapiens times. All right. Now, let's go to the question of linguistics now, first of all. In anthropology, one of the first things that you study in anthropological linguistics is how to reconstruct a language that you don't have the slightest idea what it is. Now, when I took my first anthropological linguistics course, uh, our professor would play a tape of a conversation between people in some tribe in some place in Africa or Asia, and um, he would say, well, how are we going to make any head or sense? I don't have the slightest idea what they're talking about. But by the time that course was finished on our final exam, we were able to play one of those recordings and reconstruct the details of what that, con what that language was all about. Well, how do you do that? Well, I'm not going to go through the details of how you do that here, but the principles are this. What separates human language is also what unites it. All languages that people speak are identical in structure. That is, they are composed of phonemes, the most fundamental units of sound that a person can utter, which are then grouped into the most fundamental units of meaning that are called morphemes, which are then grouped into words if they're not a word in and of themselves, and they usually aren't. So, to start with, when we're transcribing from a tape like this, we would take anthropological linguistic symbols for ah, for example, or buh, and we would use that because we hear that when we're listening to the tape, and we'd write it down, and then we would want to know what sound follows that. and. Uh, we would probably find that there are several under different circumstances depending upon where it is in the sentence and we would write those down. Once you've got a written transcript in sounds of what is being uttered you can begin to attach meaning to it and, and uh, meaning like in English so that we could understand what that morpheme means when it's grouped into a word. Now you just have to take my word for it that this works but it is fascinating. It's, I couldn't believe it myself when, when I, I ended up getting an A in that course finally, uh, much to my surprise because it wasn't easy. Probably the most difficult course I had had other than microbiology and uh, in terms of consuming time. But what this leads us to then is the possibility of reconstructing languages which no living person has ever heard. Now this is called glottochronology and lexicostatistics. Invented originally by a communist named Morris Swadish, who was forced to leave the United States in the McCarthy period, and he fled to Mexico. He ended his life in the University of Alberta in Edmonton. Uh, by that time, he'd become a world-famous, renowned scholar, and of course, the McCarthy era was gone, and uh, he could surface again. Well, this was important to me in our research, uh, doctoral research up there that we have talked about already in uh, Ice Mountain, that is in northern British Columbia along the Stikine River, because the Toltan Indians there were speaking what we call a, a one of the languages of the Athabascan language family, which uh, 5,000 years ago occupied the heartland, the Fairbanks area, the, the central part of Alaska. But, and then they had started to move, and one of the People that uh, peoples that had come out of that were tall tan Indians. Uh, well, where did these uh, Proto Athabascans come from? And well, Swadesh had created a language group that he called Nadine, uh, and what he was able to show was from this Proto Athabascan language, which we reconstruct linguistically. In other words, if you know if you got 20 different Athabascan languages, you could tell the common language from which you descended. Just take my word for it. So you can do that. Now once you've got that language, of course there's a certain amount of statistical error, isn't there, that's going to be involved in any, any study like this. So you get increasingly less complete confidence as you push it back. Not in a, he figured, had begun, had occupied northern China 
Siberia and the adjacent part of North America uh, by 15,000 years ago. Well, needless to say, no living person had ever heard Proto-Athabascan or Nadine, and uh, so. But this is how it was reconstructed. This is called glottochronology and lexical statistics, and it all flows from the fact that if you anthropological linguistics gives you a mathematically accurate command over the specifics of the way in which languages relate to each other. All right, so that's a very, as you can see, a very important part of anthropology, and it continues to be important today. Because of Swadesh's politics, this being a communist, this whole thing was considered highly subversive by the U.S. ruling class uh, when I was growing up and, and even when I was in the university uh, in Calgary, but by that time, of course, uh, we knew pretty much why these things were happening. All right. In addition to cultural anthropology and anthropological linguistics and the archaeology we went through last time, uh, there's the area of physical anthropology. To get an idea of what physical anthropology started out like, think of this. Um, if you were an intellectual in North America or Europe, a white man, of course, looking around at the rest of the world, uh, you would say, boy, you know, the most advanced people in the world are white. It must be that we are superior to all of these colored peoples that occupy all of these other countries. This was the most common viewpoint of that period. The only ones that said, no, that's not the case, the culture determines the course of evolution, were Marx and Engels, but everybody else lined up on the uh, side of, well, there's got to be some kind of underlying physical superiority for white people. I think I don't need to defend the thesis that that's a lot of nonsense to you today, but that's the way they looked at it. If you want to see a, a, an example in practice is that movie Django Unchained where Calvin Candy has mastered the science of phrenology. And actually, I, until I watched that movie, I had forgotten about the science of phrenology. But back in the 1850s, before the Civil War, um, this was pretty popular, especially among so-called intellectuals of, of the plantation owners of the South. And the idea was that by examining bumps on the skull, uh, you could make scientific determinations as to a person's relative intelligence to others. And of course this was a, another way of, another thesis for justification of slavery in the southern states. Well, that's what we had to get out of, uh, and we did. The, uh, by the turn of the century, scientists have begun to take a much more scientific view of what the physical differences between people meant. By the time I started graduate school, a man named Joseph Birdsell was the premier textbook writer of physical anthropologists in North America, and he'd settled many questions which you see the cat press trying to bring up again and again, which is disgusting to me. For example, Birdsell, 50 years ago, showed that there was no difference between Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons, or modern man for that matter, except in the minds of those that perceived them. He, he said, in essence, he was saying that these European aristocratic dilettante intellectuals don't like the idea that they could be related to what they consider to be ugly primitive features of Neanderthals. But the truth is that there is no difference in the brain capacity of modern man or uh, Cro-Magnon types or um, contemporary European white types and Neanderthals, except that the Neanderthals are a little bit smarter. <laughs> If you, if you want to use sheer cubic centimeter cranial capacity as a guideline. Well, in other words, Birdsell settled that question by saying, this talk about Neanderthals being extinguished by some Cro-Magnons which were smarter than they were is silliness. But, you know, that argument keeps coming up in the cap press today, even though it was resolved 50 years ago. So why is that? I think it's obvious why. They don't want a scientific resolution of that question. They want to keep trying to relate human differences to some kind of underlying biological pattern because in that way they can justify one kind of capitalist exploitation or imperialist dominance or another. And uh, they have the ability, since they control the press, to uh, they own the press, they have the ability to uh, resurrect any kind of dead horse that they want to. And 
and as a consequence they will put money behind people that they think are working in that direction. Well, another example is the, all of this discussion about Australopithecine uh, skeletons, some leading to modern man, some not. Well, many, for 50 years, many anthropologists have known that uh, there isn't any significant difference between any of these Australopithecine specimens. Uh, what we should be looking at, when, if what the significant thing is, is their ability to use culture, then what we should be looking at is the cubic centimeter cranial capacity of them. And uh, whether they have a ridge down the center of their head or high eyebrows doesn't mean anything. Now in paleontology, when you are using the traditional speciation method, you have millions of years of time depth, and now physical differences and uh, the way a particular line of fossils appears in the record does have significance. But we're all, all, when we're talking about humans, it's from Australopithecines to modern man, we're talking about at the most three, three or four or five million years. So uh, it's a completely different time depth kind of situation. All over Africa, south and east, we see Australopithecines from the beginning of, the, uh, of their discovery there. Um, the first ones were discovered in 1924, but what I mean is from the beginning temporal uh, line, period that's been ascribed to them, we can see that one thing they have in common is they have the same cubic centimeter cranial capacity, more or less. They have other outward features, which in some cases are rather dramatically different, but they need to be explained in some other way. Um, and I'm not going to take that any further except to say that physical anthropology today has gotten to the point where it's much more scientific, much more, you would think, much more likely to be accurate because it's so heavily based on modern genetic theory and DNA. But it's hasn't altogether made progress. For example, when it was discovered not that many years ago, about 20 years ago I guess now, that uh, you can trace population relationships with analyzing the structure of ribosomal RNA, uh, one of the first conclusions the cat press liked to see was, and they jumped to, was well, the, everybody is related to somebody that walked out of Africa 100,000 years ago and that's the end of the story. Well, of course, that should be obvious nonsense. The, uh, this, this would require that you would completely ignore all of the archaeological data that has shown different stone tool phases over a period of several million years and shown their evolution from one end to the other. Uh, their RNA, ribosomal RNA techniques are useful in studying population movements in modern peoples, uh, but that's it. You don't want to take it any further than that. Okay, these are principles of anthropology that you need to be aware of, and uh, one of the books I'll recommend to you if you want to really get into it is Marvin Harris's book called Culture, People, and Nature. Uh, in 1971, I think he brought out his first edition. It was called Culture, Man, and Nature. He died a few years ago. I'm not sure whether they've hired somebody else at the publishers to pick that book up or not. Uh, but what, back in the days when I was teaching principles of anthropology and cultural anthropology, I used to use his book, even though it had serious errors. Now, this is a fellow that I told you before had written the book, The Rise of Anthropological Theory, uh, where he wrote a chapter on dialectical materialism, with demonstrating that he didn't have the slightest idea what it was all about. But what he did, dem what he did bring in was the he accepted historical materialism was a different thing. Well. Harris is, and it was in his mind, a Marxist, and he is one of them. In my lifetime, there's been a constant parade, decade after decade, of new guys who come up who claim that they've made Marx more scientific, and Harris was one of them. Um, what it is really is just an attempt to be acceptable to the bourgeois class to, that they belong to or which they wish they belonged to. and. Uh, that's Harris's shortcoming, but he has, because he thinks he's a Marxist, or he used to think that, he has done a, produced a textbook which is as close in the capitalist world as you're going to get to one that's actually accurate. And so I recommend that you get that book, P, uh, 
culture, people, and nature uh, in whatever umpteenth form and publication it is now. Okay. Now, having gone that far, I want to go to the next step, which is um, I wrote a paper a couple of years ago, which is now an appendix in your book, ABCs of Communism, Bolshevism 2015, on uh, Marx's third great discovery. And I think that uh, what, let me try and boil this down for you. Leslie White, the man who reintroduced Marxism in North America, recognized something that was very important, and that is that the underlying mechanism of cultural evolution had yet to be explained. And one of the students, one of the, one of the people that followed his lead was Marvin Harris, uh, the man that we've just mentioned, who also took White's thesis of uh, increasing efficiency of utilization of energy as the underlying mechanism to explain cultural evolution. Well. I also recognized, and one of the reasons I went into anthropology to begin with through archaeology was that there was an underlying failure to explain the mechanisms by that propelled cultural evolution to begin, to begin with. Well, since neither White nor Harris understood dialectics, they weren't really able to pick up where Marx left off. And what they came up with was a very mechanical thing. Uh, they're saying, well, as time goes on, people get to use their tools better and they become more efficient in the utilization of energy and that's what's driving society forward. But this does not answer some fundamental questions that have to be answered as part of this. And that is, how is it that people lived for five or six million years as primitive communists with altruism and egalitarianism as the way in which they organized their kinship-based societies and then suddenly transformed into class-divided slaves versus slave masters society, which is not altruistic or egalitarian in any way. That has to be explained. It has to be part, integral part, of the entire explanation of the motor of cultural evolution. So I set myself the task of trying to figure that out and it took me the better part of 40 years to do it. Well, why is that? Well, one reason is that the categories that we use in everyday life are not applicable to primitive society. For example, and, and when Marshall Solins, who's a Marxist theoretician, wrote his book, Stone Age Economics, one of the things that Marshall Solins pointed out in Stone Age Economics, which was published in 1974, in its first edition. There's a new edition that was published a few years ago. It's the same book, but it's a, a new edition. Um, the was that you can't understand primitive society in bourgeois terms, meaning our terms. We live in a capitalist society dominated by bourgeois social relations. And he says, you can't understand primitive cultures that way. You have to understand primitive cultures in their own terms. Well, now that's important. It's important. You have to be able to yeah, a proper Marxist interpretation of sociocultural evolution has to answer these questions, fundamental questions about the transition from societis to civitas, from altruism to sadism, from egalitarian social relations to class dynamic social relations, and it has to do it within the same framework that it explains everything else fundamentally about the utilization of energy. Now, what I was able to do eventually, I f finally figured out that what we were, what we had to do here was to look at social evolution in terms not of increasing energy utilization efficiency in and of itself, but to answer the social questions, we had to answer the question as to what were the consequences of each of the changes which went on. And when we do that, what we see is that the important thing that was changing here is not just the better tools making more things more efficiently, but what was happening with the spare time that people had as they became more knowledgeable about their environment. With that spare time, they were able to think about a lot of things. They began to develop a worldview. 
I mean, I have to do something with that time. There's only so much time you can spend having sex, um, and when <laughs> rest and and if you're getting to be pretty good at your food production, there's something else you have to do with that time. Well, one of them is, of course, uh, to begin to cogitate about the nature of the world around you and study the world around you. Well, to the degree that that study of the world around them gave them a better insight into the way in which wild resources could be exploited, yes, they're burning up time that they have to spend someplace, social time, and they're doing it without actively using it to in some technological way. But on the other hand, they're building up a storehouse of knowledge about the plants and animals and the rocks in the atmosphere and the rivers and so on in their atmosphere, in their environment. And it's that information which is going to lead toward more technological innovation by accident down the road. And even if you learn something in school and it doesn't seem to have any immediate application for you, and then somewhere down the road you took a course in mechanics in college or microbiology and uh, now you're in your car breaks down or you're stuck in a Peruvian prison and the information that you got about the mechanical things that you learned that didn't seem to be of any interest or value to you ten years ago or the microbiology you learned when you were in junior college or wherever you were and you're stuck in a Peruvian prison and you get paratyphoid or uh, <laughs> some kind of dysentery has sudden immediate application, doesn't it? So what I'm saying here is by accident they're building up as a side product, in other words, of all of this cogitation that they're involved in as they get more and more free time is creating necessarily an even greater bank of information which at some future point can be used technologically. And that is the key. That was the key that evaded me for 40 years and that's showed us why White and Harris's mechanical materialism of calculating how much energy is produced in each society uh, that they have arranged in a superimposed sequence of uh, a hierarchy of social evolution. Yes, that's all true, but it's not just the information that they're, it's not just the economic system which is evolving at the moment. It's all of that information which they are gathering and accumulating about the world around them which will eventually force a transition or make a transition possible. For example, B. Gordon Child who was one of the first Marxist archaeologists of great import who wrote many books which were popular in, that when I was growing up, like Man Makes Himself, What Happened in History, um, Prehistory of Europe, uh, Dawn of European Civilization, uh, these were books that were on the newsstands in those days. Now, b but uh, what he was trying to do was to find the causal mechanism to explain why society suddenly began to evolve more quickly along the current path. And one of the first conclusions he came to was that, well, environmental change had, cr had happened at the end of the last ice age and that this had forced uh, people to do certain things that they wouldn't have done otherwise. In other words, he put the locus of primary causality on the environment. Now, Child was as good a Marxist as there was in anthropology in his time, but that's not saying as much as it might have been saying because there are, these were all questions which had not yet been resolved and therefore Marxist archaeology and anthropology was also paralyzed in time. Uh, wasn't moving forward theoretically. Now, because if it if we had been doing this properly to begin with, Child would have had to say, well, we know that causation, primary causation, must always be internal to any given phenomena. That's a fundamental epistemological law of uh, uh, dialectical materialism. Okay, epistemology is theory of knowledge, and it starts with a certain set fundamental set of principles and laws. That's one of them. Primary causality is internal. Secondary causality is external. So in a socio-cultural formation in a natural environment, primary causation can't lie with the environment. By definition, it has to be within that socio-cultural formation. Because 
societies do not evolve in a vacuum, but in a natural environment, then we can identify the nat natural environment as secondary causation. Now, if uh, when, for example, we are looking at the far, uh, what, what in his day they call the Near East, uh, or in our time in North America, if we were looking at the Great Basin, we'd say roughly 9,500 to 11,000 years ago, there was a radical change in the environment and things dried up. And that triggered a uh, new course in terms of social evolution. That's the way childhood looked at it. That's the way most North Americans looked at it. Um, I didn't look at it that way because I was already in, I wrote my very first paper on causality and process in the prehistoric socio-cultural evolution of the Southwest and gave it at my first professional paper at a meeting which got me into the next Society for American Archaeology meeting and then accepted at the University of Calgary. But my point was that uh, these, in both those cases, whether it's Egypt and the Near East or whether it was in the Great Basin, it was not the environmental shift which changed things. So in order to see whether I was right or not, I went to the Southwest Museum Library on the highway, freeway to Pasadena, and uh, I got a lot of help there from the librarians. I got every site report in its original form that had ever been written on every archaeological site in Oregon, Idaho, and, uh, and Nevada, and the Great Basin areas. And what I found it was that at the bottom levels, according to each of these investigators, who had no axe to grind, of course, uh, what did we find? We found grinding tools, grinding stones that had been used. Well, what were they grinding? They weren't grinding corn. That hadn't even been domesticated yet. and certainly hadn't gotten to North America. They were grinding wild seeds. So what does that tell us? It tells us what it should have told us, that sociocultural evolution in these places had already evolved to the point at which when an environmental shift occurred, people didn't have to uh, pack up their stuff and head for a more friendly climate, which they could easily do. They had plenty of time to, they had centuries here to uh, decide that, well, we've had enough of living around Elko, I think what I'm going to do is move to California or wherever they might have gone. Um, they had an alternative. They could say, well, I'll just stay here in Elko because I can grind up all these wild seeds with my, as I have been doing and we'll just rely more on bread this fall than we will on hunted or gathered material. See what I'm getting at here? The internal preparation was there. By going through all those site reports, I was able to prove it. It was not the shift in environment which created the, what we call a desert culture and then that led to the high cultures of the American Southwest. It was their prior preparation technologically that they had developed that gave them the alternative or the option of doing that. So today, and if you have a problem in Las Vegas, for example, you could adjust your thermostat. You can change the temperature. You can do what uh, uh, Bugsy said said to Meyer Lansky and his associates when they came to ask him why he had sold this bar, uh, and he's <laughs> one of the guys says. I don't understand. What is the connection between Hoover Dam and fucking? And he says, air conditioning. Well, that is how far culture has advanced to uh, in our time. But 10,000 years ago, around Elko and Reno and those areas up there uh, that, that felt this the quickest, then uh, they had an alternative already. They could start to stay in place because they had developed the technological ability. It's not air conditioning but or heating, but they, they developed the technological ability to exploit plants instead of animals and to, by exploiting their seeds. All right, those are... So, if you are interested in this line of argument, um, you can read my paper, paper on uh, Marx's magnum opus, or third magnum opus, which is the appendix to the ABCs of Communism 2015. Having done that, I think I'm going to stop here for the moment and we're going to get ready to go on to the next lecture on investigation, intelligence, and espionage.